Hello, and welcome back to Behind Schedule and Over Budget, the show where you picked up the spray painted parts a little too soon, and now they have your fingerprints on them. All right, so today's episode should be a big one and a fun one. Um, with all the parts in hand, uh, 3D printed parts, the components, components are all set up and ready to go. Um, this will be the first time we're going to be able to, to actually get in here and build up this entire unit. Um, again, this is going to be kind of a low detail run through this, just to kind of get a... Uh, get a what's the word here just a a record of how this comes together um, in the future once I work out a few more details I really want to put some detailed build instructions together so that if anybody out there out there wants to try this themselves you'll have some good instructions to follow but for now I definitely like to just since we've been following along with this build from the beginning this is going to be the first time that we're going to be able to see it be a completed build so to start um, I've got the display and the display frame laid out in front of me, so I think we should start here and build this up. Um, first thing with this display frame to note is that a few things. Uh, you'll note that there's a little some rough edges on the display frame. I've had to cut in a few areas in order to get this to fit inside of the display shell. Uh, that is because of a lot of the warping issues that the display shell is having. Um, it's, I'm having a little bit of issues fitting the, uh, the display frame into there. And beyond that, I've also taken the liberty of uh, spray painting the front of this just to kind of get a little bit of the inconsistencies from the 3D print out of it. Um, it's not perfect, but I think it's good for, for now. I think it'll look nice uh, once we start to get some good pictures of it. Um, beyond that, I've already gone ahead and display, er, uh, assembled the wings to the side of the, uh, the main frame. Um, again, that's just a bunch of screws. No sense doing that on video. Um, I definitely I used a little bit of Loctite to hold these screws in place. We'll be using that a little bit more throughout the video. And I also put the dowel pins in for the pivots and drop the set screws inside of there to hold those in place. So that's mostly the display frame as an assembled unit. Um, so if you're doing this yourself, remember, you've got to put dowel pins in. These might be a bit of a press fit, and if they're not, there's a set screw in there to hold them in place. And then you'll have to uh, screw the side walls on. And hopefully I'll work out how best to modify these parts so that you don't have to do all this snipping and filing that I did in order to make it fit. Um, but with that out of the way, let's get the display and drop it in. So first things first, the display has a screen protector that I've left on for the time being, but it does look a little ugly. So I think we can go ahead and get that. Let's see. Oop, one second. Careful now. Mm. Yeah, turns out that wasn't a screen protector. That was just a sticker. Um, so this is the display. Let me wipe it off real quick. I kind of thought there was an entire peel away sticker on there, but it turns out there wasn't, um, which is kind of odd. Regardless, the display is all ready to go. So in order to keep it from getting a little too dirty, I'm gonna just put a little something soft underneath of it. Let's get that over there. Um, yep, we're just going to drop the display right down in here, right over top of those four holes in, t in the interior of the case. And it's one reason I have the hot glue gun going right now, is that we're going to just uh, fixture this cable in a little bit so it doesn't go anywhere. But before that, let's get this screwed in place. And like I said, using a little bit of blue Loctite in order to hold these screws in place, um, keeps the assembly nice and quick, keeps bomb costs down, um, the build material costs, because, you know, who wants to buy... Uh, you know, flat washers, lock washers, all that stuff. Um, but we also want to stop these screws from, from backing out in the future. So a little bit of Loctite goes a long way for a build like this. I'm not exactly sure how it behaves with PLA, but I haven't seen any any big issues with it so far. So for the, mean, in the, for the time being, I'm going to be using it. So let's go to that screw in the top left. It's a little bit tough right now. Hopefully that catches. Yep. Okay, we're just going to screw this display in in four corners. And I think we went over this in the previous episode, um, talked about how the ribbon cable is fixtured and how the uh, power cable is fixtured as well. Um, so once that's out of the way, we'll talk about running the cables out through the bottom in order to make the connection into the, uh, the, rest, of the, the, or the rest of the shell, the display shell. Sorry. Make the connection into the rest of the casework hard to work on these screws and talk at the same time. 
Let's get this little screw in. And again, some of the details we'll talk about here might change in the future as I uh, yeah, make a few decisions on how best to assemble this and how best to maintain it. Let's make sure these screws are tight. One, two. For the time being, I think we've got a pretty straightforward, and again, I'm actually pleasantly surprised, there's a pretty straightforward assembly to this. Um, so one thing to do real quick, let's take a hot glue gun and just plop a little bit of hot glue right here in order to keep that cable from going anywhere. And then next thing, I'm going to have to take the uh, right angle HDMI adapter off for a minute so we can feed the ribbon cable through. When you build this, this is a feature that I'm not sure how whether it'll survive, um, but there's a little slot in the front of this. You can see it right there. Um, that's kind of just meant to keep the ribbon cable and the power cable kind of just in the correct direction as they go through. So you feed them through that slot. Ooh, got a little squirrely as it went through, but that worked. Um, do the same thing with the power cable. And yeah, that just sort of holds them in place so that they don't wiggle. Um, the next thing beyond that is actually a little strap that I plan to add here that should hopefully keep, um, should hopefully strain relieve both of these connectors or both of these cables. Um, but for the time being, they're actually pretty well strain relieved by A, passing through this slot, and B, the hot glue that's been used over here. So I'm not super worried about it. I think I can come back and figure out, take a little more time to work out the best way to do that. But for the time being, this is nice and ready to go now. Um, we're ready to drop this into the display shell. So with the display shell, we have a set of grooves that run on the inside of this, and that is meant to catch the corners of the display frame. And that's really it. Um, remember, there's very little height available uh, in this direction. Basically, the top of this HDMI connector is about as high as you can go. So you want to make sure if you're fixing your cables down, make sure they're as low profile as they can be. And hopefully with all that out of the way, you should be able to take this and slide it. Now remember, I cut a little bit of the edges off here, so this doesn't catch as early as it should. To be able to just slide it right in. Make sure your cables aren't snagged or anything. And hopefully we can just drop it right down and into place. And just like that. So that is seated, and it looks like... Yep, it looks like the screw holes are well enough aligned. It is definitely... Due to the warping issues with these parts, it is definitely a bit of a pain to get this to fit correctly, which is why I've cut back the edges of the frame a little bit so that we're only making contact at smaller points. That way, if there is some warpage and these parts aren't as uh, accurate as they should be, at the very least, you only have to be accurate at certain corners. And we can maybe put, you can maybe push and pull the display shell in order to, uh, in order to conform to that a little bit. So with that in, Let's get two of our the main screws that we're going to use for this, which are uh, M4 or sorry M3 by eight millimeter long flathead screws with uh, black oxide coating. So these are going to be used almost everywhere in this design. Um, the other screws we actually saw before were M3 pan heads that are inside of this case, and that's mostly the inside of this display shell is one of the few areas we use those screws extensively. Um, everywhere else, it's just the uh, M3 screws or the uh, flat, or black oxide flathead screws. So I've only got two of these holes tapped right now, the left and the right. But just go ahead and screw this on. You'll see the four holes at the top should align to four holes in the uh, display shell. Um, getting that alignment has definitely been a challenge so far as I've been building these. Uh, so hopefully this screw will actually engage. Yep, looks like we got it. You may find yourself having to, depending on how much warping you're dealing with, you may find yourself having to snip the corners of the display frame a little bit or, you know, file them down in order to make them fit properly. Um, I had to do a little bit of that work. But once you're done, you should be able to seat that display frame right into this shell and your entire display assembly is ready to go. So that was pretty straightforward. So the next thing we want to do, I believe, is probably assemble the rear, uh, the rear shell or the rear cap. Um, which has a lot of other of the main components on it. Let's see, let's pull it apart. It's getting a lot of stuff stuck to it. So, this is our rear cap. 
Um, it's been spray painted, so it's a little, uh, it's a little tiny bit sticky, but I think it's dry now. Um, so what's going to go into here is our Raspberry Pi, our power boost, our battery, our power switch. Um, really, like the a lot of the meat of this unit is in this one part, which is good because it allows us to do a lot of this work while this part is out of the uh, of the unit itself and free or you know easy to get a hold of. So I think the first thing I want to do is install the Raspberry Pi. Um, one thing I didn't mention in the last episode as I was talking about the modifications of these parts is that these mounting holes for the Raspberry Pi have actually been tapped for an M3 hole. Um, sounds a little crazy, but it's very doable uh, actually, and you get a fairly reliable. Uh, thread out of it, and I wouldn't put a, sh a ton of torque on it, but it's usable. Um, and these two holes in the front, at least, I know I have four holes set up here, but I, I found that it's only worth it to use the front two holes are the ones we're going to be screwing into. So it looks like the hot glue is coming off of this, but I'm just going to let that slide for now. So the Raspberry Pi, you're just going to drop in to the openings for it in the front. Just like that and with that aligned um, one thing that's a little off about at least the build we're going to do today is we need a slightly longer screw to seat this one given the fact that i just kind of goofed up on that or at the very least i thought we were going to have two different types of m3 screws in this build a longer one and a shorter one but after a while i was able to standardize around the shorter screw so you know if we can cut anything we can off the build material save a little bit of money it's worth it for the time being, I think we're using a 10 millimeter screw instead of an eight in order to get a hold of the Raspberry Pi. See, do we have enough there? Nope, we need something a little longer. Looks like there's also a bag of 12 millimeter screws that we'll probably be using for this one. Like I said, in the future, that's because I put the flathead, uh, the sorry, the yeah, countersunk hole um, right here at the top surface um, for the next version of this um, the one that you know would be available that hole is actually sunken in further so that an eight millimeter screw can be used in order to get a hold of the Raspberry Pi so for the time being I'm gonna have to use something like a 16 millimeter screw in order to get through there let's get that screw in yeah that actually catches And again, make sure the the connector for the or the cable for the keyboard is uh, in a good spot. And just screw that down until it's a bit tight. Hopefully, you can maybe see the screw start to come through right there. And again, we'll just do the front two. The rear two have a little bit of trouble aligning. I'm not exactly sure if that's due to the 3D print, the Raspberry Pi, uh, one of my measurements being off. But regardless, the front two screws are more than enough to fixture this. All of the interactions you're going to have with this unit, or the Raspberry Pi itself, are going to be through the USB connectors for the most part. So, um, yeah, there's not a ton of reason to get the uh, the rear two screws in. If they align, great. Actually, it looks like they might align for this build. So, let's just go ahead and grab two of them and drop them in. If they don't align, now, if you're having any trouble, ah, I forgot, these have to be drilled out. So, let's just forget about them for now. Again, if you're having any trouble aligning those, um, it's not the end of the world. You don't need them. Just the front two. So the next thing that's going to go into this is the Power Boost 1000. So again, like the Raspberry Pi, the two front holes here, the mounting holes, have been tapped for an M3 thread. And we're going to in install it pretty much the same exact way as we did the Raspberry Pi. Um, so that sits right here in the middle. So just drop it in place. Get the connector out of the way. And yeah, just put a little bit of pressure. Actually, you know what? One thing that has to be done before that though is the battery. Because it's very difficult to get at that battery connector, so it's good to install the battery first into the battery well and then connect it to the power boost and then install the power boost. So the battery, this uh, this battery well was originally this size for this 6600 milliamp hour battery. So it fits in there nice and snugly. Um, but since I'm at least changing batteries around a little bit or in between um, different power supply options, I'm going with a 4400 milliamp hour battery. So that's going to sit in there loose. Uh, what I've done in the meantime, uh, depending on what battery you may choose or this lands on, I might either, I might either shorten this, uh, put an adapter in there. In the time being, I've actually just made little foam inserts that will just sit right on top of that battery and stop it from wiggling around. 
And then beyond that, we have a little battery door that goes over top of it. And we should be able to hopefully screw that in. I haven't tried these threads yet, so hopefully they came out well. But screw that down in a second. And that should keep our battery pretty well. Uh, it's going to hold our battery for, uh, pretty securely, stop it from wiggling around. And yeah, that should be it. Let's see, one. Two. Yep. Can't hear it wiggling. Can't hear it flying back and forth. So that's perfect. So yep, with that in, let's go right to the power boost. Now let's make the connection to the, bat the battery first. Plug that right in. Like that. And then we're going to seat the power boost where it needs to go. Make sure no cables are interfering or anything. Get that right in. You can leave the, you can leave the uh, power switch unconnected or uninstalled first to get the power boost down. We just want to get, let's make sure this battery cable is routed correctly. Oops, it's not great. Mm, tough one here. Okay. That's, I actually don't like that very much. Let's double it over itself. Okay. That's better. Try to keep this low as possible. There's going to be some cabling that has to go on up here as well. I keep this battery cable low. And yep, let's get those aligned. Two more eight millimeter flathead M3 screws go in in order to lock the power boost in place. Feel those screws catching, get them a little tight. No need to crank down on them too much. Might add some Loctite to this in the future, but for the time being, that should be plenty. So now our power boost and our Raspberry Pi are installed. Our battery's connected. Um, and we're ready, I think, to add this to the main shell of the unit. So let's bring that over now and get cracking on that. And maybe, actually, let's uh, work on putting the power connector in place. So again, this is kind of a, a bit of an afterthought on, on my part. and probably should have put a little bit more thought into this. A um, few issues here is that this is a strange little uh, switch, actually. Something I bought special for another project. It has, it's a kind of a right angle mount, so you can actually screw it down on those little wings, on those little flanges, and then the uh, connectors that are, the switch is at a right angle. Um, I designed it around that, but I'm considering switching that out for something else in the future. Um, for the time being, I'm going to leave it as is. I think a lot of things are going to change on this rear case, but this can get built up into a working unit now. So let's follow through with that and then start to make our decisions based on kind of this, this alpha build. Um, so in order to hold this in place, my plan was to actually just kind of fill this fill this hole that the connector sits in with hot glue. Um, but I'd like to, that's kind of a, if you have to take the connector out in the future, it becomes very difficult, or the, the switch. So instead, I'm going to use a little spacer, a little wedge made of uh, some wrapped up masking tape and just kind of press it in there behind the connector. Um, it's enough to stop the connector from pushing in when you try to flick it, um, or when you try to switch it, and it stops it from sliding back and forth. It's probably a little in danger of coming out, so I'm just going to put a bead of hot glue on there, but it should be easy to pull that hot glue off. If we were to fill that entire cavity, kind of just pot it shut with hot glue, it was going to be impossible to get this connector out. I've actually already had that issue, so I'd like to avoid that and be able to salvage this in case I need to switch, um, switch, switch switches and uh, go with something else in the future. So let's get this down and let's just see, let me see what's going on there. And let's just put a little bead of hot glue right there. Something we can just kind of peel back if need be. That should hopefully keep the, uh, keep that switch nice and secure. All right. So now, we're fairly complete or fairly finished with the rear cap assembly. What we have to do from here is get this into the main unit, uh, make a few connections, and we're almost done at that point. So let's set this aside for a moment and bring out the base. So here's our base, and the other part that's going to go with that is the uh, keyboard filler that goes in behind the keyboard, and obviously the keyboard. Um, so 
The JJ50, it's got five mounting holes on it, um, and there's five corresponding mounting holes on the base. These are going to take little number one sized plastic tapping screws. You can see them right there, they're very small. Um, what I found so far is that there were no official dimensions for this available online, so it was kind of hard to get everything lined up correctly. Uh, so far, it seems that about three of the five holes will align correctly. Um, but overall, I found that you only need to get two of them um, on opposite ends of the board, of the keyboard, to engage, and you get a pretty good amount of hold at that point. You're always going to be pressing down on the keyboard. There's no good places to wrench up on it. So I've been sticking with just two holes for now. In the future, I will adjust this accordingly and try to get, you know, all five of them to fit, hopefully, or to align. Um, one thing I'm going to need, if you bear with me for one moment, is a very small screwdriver because as you can see these are little screws and even the uh, even my medium sized screwdriver here doesn't work very well with it so I'll be right back alright we're back so I was able to find the smallest Phillips head screwdriver I have in the house. Um, oh boy. So yeah, these are a little finicky to work with, these screws. You also have to get them down in between the switches. So one thing I like to do is use a needle nose pliers, uh, grab them, and just drop them in place. And they'll hold from there. Um, the other fun thing to note with this is that, again, it's a very small screwdriver. And these are plastic tapping screws, so you need to put a good bit, of, good amount of torque on them. Um, so you're gonna have a bit of a fun time. It might be worth, you know, getting these on a vice or a vice grip and uh, giving yourself a little more leverage. But overall, it's pretty, uh, pretty doable to get these screws in place. Let's drop this one in. There we go. Let's get that one turning. still a little loose. I'm not happy about how much pressure I have to put on it. So, yeah, it's a little loose. You can see those screws aren't seating fully. The hole's probably a little too tight. Um, I've gotten these to seat on a different version of this base. So this is actually a, uh, a newer one. A newer version of it. You just got to get a little more torque on them. That's really what it boils down to. Now don't crank down too hard lest you uh, damage the PCB on the, the keyboard. But okay now that's held pretty securely in place. A little bit more. Yep. All right so that's the keyboard in. And yeah, I had, again, you have to remove the top four, uh, top four keycaps. We'll put those on at the end. Let's move ahead with the build. So the next thing we're going to want to do is get the keyboard filler in. Um, that's going to cover up the uh, USB connector for the keyboard. So again, take our left angle USB mini connector, plug that into the keyboard right here. There's a little, uh, there's a little indentation in the in the uh, base in order to fit that, and that's about all you have to do there. And then the keyboard filler, I've made a few modifications to this one. I pulled back the uh, wall here um, just to give it a little bit of extra space. So I plan to roll those changes into the CAD as soon as possible. Um, remember, we go wider part, goes towards the uh, keyboard. We drop this over top, and we just, just have to wiggle it around enough so that it seats fully. And that's really it. Pick it up. Let's look at the bottom. And I'll just put two of these screws in for now just to keep things moving. Again, those are 8mm M3 flathead screws, the black oxide coating. One's in. Uh, one note about, I guess, the hole tapping. Another reason why I tried to go with the shortest screw possible is that because we're tapping threads into all of these parts, um, a longer screw just means more thread has to be engaged. And that means more tapping, more chance of binding up your tap, breaking it in half, whatnot. Um, these screws, they all have about maybe five threads of engagement. 
which means you don't have to tap a super deep hole. I think five threads of engagement is more than enough in order to hold these together. Um, and again, that just keeps you from having to tap like, you know, you know, a half an inch worth of threads into this part, uh, which is going to drive you insane. So you only have to get a few good threads into the plastic and you're able to screw them together just like that. And just for, uh, just for posterity, I think we'll be putting all the screws in. And like I said before, you know, I was really worried at first that this build was actually going to be very finicky to get together. Um, but one thing I didn't really count on was that how much of this build can actually be done with the display shell not installed. Um, and with that not installed, you actually have a lot of access to what's going on inside of here. So there we go. That's the keyboard filler on. And there's our keyboard installed. So just for fun, let's put the keycaps back on. Put zero, backspace key, the delete key, if I'm not mistaken, they're not actually marked with delete, and the P, let's get the escape key, uh, I think this is tab, no, tab's above shift, I'm not actually sure what this key is, let's put the one on, and Q. All right, there's our keyboard with our uh, right angle USB connector sticking out. So the next thing we're gonna do is bring in our, our rear cap assembly right here. So get, the, uh, get that connector out of the way, get everything loose and free, drop the rear cap on. This is gonna require, um, I think these are, let's see, how long are these? One and a half inch. So one and a half inch long, 632 screws. Again, uh, sized accordingly because these are the only ones available on McMaster that are long enough. Um, I wanted these to be M3, but M3 tops off at a length that cannot get all the way through the rear cap. So 632 screw, uh, we can get those an inch and a half black oxide screws. So those, those were the winners. So all you have to do there is drop them into corners here and here, screw them into place. And again, at this point, we're probably about halfway done, maybe even a little bit more. Um, we're just going to make a couple connections and then drop the display shell in, and we're nearly finished. Um, it's a little bit of a shorter assembly, obviously, because we don't have uh, we don't have speakers, we don't have anything like that. I'm even skipping on the the headphone jack for the time being. Um, but again, I'd like to just get this kind of put together, um, feel my way through it, give, have a couple you know have a couple weeks to just use it as is and see what I like and don't like about it and then maybe I also have a break <laughs> um, this has been going on for longer than I expected um, it is it's taking longer and it's costing more which uh, is keeping with the theme or keeping with the title of this channel um, so I would like to stop working on this for a little bit once we get this put together but also I'd also like a chance to toy with it see how it feels see what I like and don't like and then come back after a break with fresh eyes and make some adjustments accordingly. So that's why we're gonna get through a, an initial build of this and then come back in the future. So with this all in place, we can keep this wire out of the way for now. Uh, first connection we can make is the uh, connection for the keyboard. So it's a little awkward. Like I said, I would rather this been a straight USB connector, but it's not the end of the world. You just have to kinda, kinda work the cable into place a little bit. And there's enough space down in the corner here to just drop it in. Um, I'm probably not doing the, these these uh, wires any favors down in this corner, but I'm just gonna push it down and leave it there for now. Yeah, it's a little tight actually. Let's try it this way. Uh, one thing, most of the times I've built this were without this battery door, so I was able to kind of push the push this cable set down in the corner here, but with the battery door, there's a little bit less space available for it. Um, that's gonna have to do for now, and I think we'll even go ahead and. Just tack this in place with a tiny bit of hot glue. A tiny bit is all we have left in the gun right now. Where's my hot glue drawer? <sighs> I put things in these drawers and then I completely forget what I put or where I put them. Fresh hot glue. Let's get that loaded up. And yeah, let's just 
fixture that a little bit. Again, I love hot glue for stuff like this. It keeps these cables from, from moving around too freely. Um, it's a quick and easy solution. It allows you to have your own options for how you want to go about this. Um, and then if you need to take it apart in the future, you just kind of yank on that and that hot glue will come loose. Um, so keyboards connect it to the Raspberry Pi. Let's get the Raspberry Pi connected to the power. Uh, that's the next kind of layer that's going to go in here. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention about this cable is that this specific cable, this should be in the build material. Um, when when we connect it, we're kind of it's going to kind of be connected like this. And the extra strain relief on the back of these cables was kind of interfering with each other, putting a little bit of stress on the connector, power connector for the Raspberry Pi. So I went ahead and cut those off. Um, it keeps things a little, you know, it puts a little bit more stress on the end of this connector than I like, but we should be good for now. Again, something I'd like to just tweak and improve in the future, but for now, I think it's good to go. So I'm going to plug this into the Raspberry Pi, loop it back over itself this way, and then the one reason I cut that wall away from the uh, keyboard filler was to allow this cable to tuck in underneath of it and then you can just tuck that cable down and plug your Raspberry Pi in. So now we have the keyboard connected and the Raspberry Pi powered and the last thing we need to do now is add the display. Um, again, so pretty quick and straightforward. So let's move the base out of the way for now. One step we need to do for the display frame it over is put the pivots on the pivot blocks so these have already been all pre-tapped there's a few m3 holes that have to be tapped in here uh, one specific one that's kind of strange is that if you look at the split here that forms the friction hinge of the unit um, this top hole is a clearance hole for a uh, m3 flathead screw and then below that on the bottom half of the block is actually a hole size for a tap so when you're gonna you have to tap that hole inside of there just pass it through the outside hole and then just tap it down um, the reason that hole exists is because this is actually forming what is a semi-functional friction hinge. Um, and to explain it, let's just get it installed first. So, let's see. So these holes here align up to the, to the pivots. And I'm already feeling that these are different prints than the ones I've been working with. They feel a little looser. So I'm a little worried on how well the friction hinge is going to work. But the point being, because of this split here um, that has our set screw in it, we're able to, when we screw down on it, we can compress that a little bit and shrink that diameter slightly so that this bites onto the, uh, the dowel pin. So let's try that out and see if it works. So you just have to get both of these blocks on and then just drop, ooh, look at that. Nailed it. <laughs> I have a, uh, a screw swimming in the, uh, the Loctite now. So get those blocks on. Let's tighten down this screw. Hopefully we get a little bit of a bite. Ah. Mm. Nah. No good. So this set, for some reason, I've either adjusted the hole size at some point in the past, or it printed a little looser than I expected. Um, we're not getting much of a bite, so these are kind of just spinning freely. So for the time being, we're not going to have a friction hinge. Um, not the end of the world, but something I'll have to fix in the future. So with these two on, we just take our base, get some wires out of the way, and drop this right on top, just like that. Now we're going to screw into these uh, blocks from the bottom, so turn it over. And you might have to just work these a little bit to get the holes aligned but there they are right there so hopefully see the holes aligned between the pivot blocks and the bottom case or the uh, the base two screws each side holds those holds those in there we go and again just to reiterate um, this has been a pretty quick build so far I mean this video is pushing 35 minutes but the fact that this can, you know, kind of be taken apart and put back together in under an hour feels pretty good, actually. Um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the, the thought that went into this was just kind of centered around how can I make this as easy as possible to assemble. Um, you know, it's it it pays to be lazy sometimes when you're a designer um, because you know you don't want to do the work, you don't want anyone else to have to do the work. So you want to find any, any cheats, any uh, you know workarounds you can to reduce the amount of work that has to be done on this. 
So again, once you got all your parts prepared um, and ready to go, to actually assemble it is really quick. Um, but again, our hinge, it's working now. The only problem is it's not a friction hinge, so things like that will happen. Um, it's, it's something I did not want in this design, um, so I'll have to adjust the designs of these uh, pivots for the time pivots, but for the time being, we can live with it. Um, the good news is the casework fits together pretty well, considering all of the uh, obviously the the front's not as clean as I'd have liked, but considering all of the warping that happened on these parts, I'm just happy that it closes well enough, and it'll look pretty good sitting on a table. So, last steps, and we're almost done here. And I can, and then you guys are free to leave. Um, we're going to connect the right angle adapter to the ribbon cable. Remember the the you know, this little white strip here that has the contacts on it that goes to the outside of the connector. Just fit that in there, drop it in place. I see. It always doesn't work when you have to do it on camera. There we go. Feed that in there. And then there's two small locks on the sides that you can compress with a needle nose plier. Sometimes when you push one side, the other side will come loose. So just work them one side, then the other a few times. And that's it. So because we've shortened up this ribbon cable a little bit, you're just going to have to tuck it underneath. Um, another feature that I'm working on here is I'd like to strain relieve this point of the connector for the ribbon cable. There's two holes in the bottom of the case for what was the original concept for the strain relieving, but I don't think it's going to work out the way I had envisioned. For the time being, it's not the end of the world that it's not there. It's just uh, it's a nice to have in the future. So what you have to do is just clear the cables out of the way. Slide this down. Probably hard to see on the camera. Kind of see it happening right there. And yeah, just get it aligned and make your connection. So let's get this cable out of the way and push. There we go. We are connected to the Raspberry Pi. And with the rear cover off, you can kind of see how the ribbon cable is behaving. It's not bad. It'll be tucked underneath here for the most part. And there's not a lot of motion to it. It keeps popping out there, but the rear cover will stop that from happening. Final connection that needs to be made before the core of this unit is done is the power for the display. So let's go ahead and just plug that in. And one way I actually was enjoying keeping this secure was to actually tuck it in between some of the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's probably going to pay to loop this underneath the ribbon cable. And again, this is something that you know you can add your own personal touch to it. There's a few other features I'd like to add in order to keep these cables nice and uh, nice and neat. But with these two in with these two in place, um, the power cable connected, the ribbon cable connected, just give the display a couple opens and closes to make sure that everything's moving the way you want it to. And we can get on to putting the last couple bits of hardware on here. We have a nearly finished unit. So last part is our rear cover. That's going to just cover this all up, make it look nice. That fits down right in there. And we're going to take our two remaining and our next two 632 screws, one and a half inches long. Oh, you know what? I don't think I tapped these holes yet. Let's see. Ah, look at that, I did. All right. So let's do that real quick before we finish up. Luckily, I've got the 632 tap drill ready. And I think these are slightly undersized, but since the 632 thread's a little more coarse, I've had a little bit more luck getting these to uh, tap. Hopefully, again, we're on camera, so obviously everything's going to go wrong. But, yeah, I'm going to have to drill these out, aren't I? Eh, we'll save it for the next episode. Regardless, for the time being, let's take these screws out. We can drop this cap on. And one thing we can do There are two more screws, two more uh, eight millimeter M3 screws that are going to tie the cap to the uh, the pivots, and those actually drop into holes here and here. They're going to drop all the way down to about this point, actually. So if you just drop them in, 
You hear them slide all the way down. It's a little bit of a, a mystery as to what's happening there. You want to just drop the screwdriver in, wiggle it around a bit until you feel it engage with the uh, with the threads on the back of the pivot blocks. This one's engaged. And then, see that one's just spinning free. There we go. Yeah, I'm just spinning free on this one. Yeah, so a few small issues here at the end of the build, sadly, but for the most part, let's get that screw back out. Try that one more time. Should align. Yeah, and take the screw, drop it down into there. Get a screwdriver, try to get the screw head. Possible. I forgot to tap that hole. Eh, looks like I forgot to tap it. So, a few holes remaining to tap, but for the most part, there's our finished computer. Um, and yeah, I mean, I am happy with how it looks. You know, I think going from the the CAD to the real thing, I think it's you know it's it's what I expected. It's what I wanted. Um, I like the color of the uh, beige that came out of it. Um, one thing, obviously, you know, these nice unsightly screw holes here will be covered by a logo that's going to go up in here. But I have a uh, graphic designer I know who is helping me out with that, and she has already done some amazing work. So I'm really looking forward to getting those labels printed and showing them off. Um, besides for that, you know, the uh, quality of the parts, there's a lot of finesse that had to go into this. But for the most part, you know, after sifting through a few runs of these parts, I was able to find a set that fit together super well. Um, or well enough, and yeah, I mean, there she is. Let's uh, let's pop the screen open. And I think we'll get a chance to get a few good pictures of this, um, and show you know for show off purposes. See, this is why we need a a friction hinge. But display is open. Display closes nicely, and. Oh, last but not least, let's see if this uh, episode ends on a bit of a, a bit of a down note. But let's power it on. We have HDMI signal. Ah, there it is. All right. Let's see, does the keyboard work? Yep. P R I N T. S U C. -C. Success. And then let's print that a lot. Enter. Run. All right. So we've done it. We've built up the entire unit. We've gone from you know a, uh, a twinkle in my eye to uh, to buying parts online to putting CAD together to soldering and you know preparing stuff and three D printing. All the way up to a finished um, computer. You know, it's our own '80s machine, our own little slice of the '80s. Um, yeah, you know, I hope I hope in the future, if you're following along with this, um, this is a fun build for you. Again, there's a lot more documentation I'd like to put out for this. I want this to be repeatable. I want this to be able to be built. I also want to work out a lot of the issues I'm currently having with the power supply. But for the time being, we know we can build it. We know it's going to come together. Um, we can only make it better from here. So yeah, um, again, probably look in the link for a uh, look in the description for a link to some good, good pictures of this, maybe with the logo on it and everything in a uh, you know a nicer environment. Um, and then look out in the future for a good set of documentation for this. Um, you know, once I work out some of the uh, some of the rough bits and get some things working correctly. All right. In the meantime, uh, thanks for joining in for the ride, and we'll see you soon.